Today we'll be talking about our rationality. And as Max said, we'll be going to the basics of rationality. How we think about rationality. So we'll be have some questions that help you evaluate how rational you are. And then we'll be exploring the nature of those questions, how we think about being rational, and discussing these things and how these topics impact our lives. So that's what we'll be doing today. So let's start with a rationality test. This is going to be the most important test you ever take in your life. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll have 45 seconds per question, and I'll be typing it. And don't cheat, that's irrational. So are you all ready to take the test? First question. Max was the president of a secular student club in college. He's an outspoken teacher in Alabama, defending the theory of evolution against the religious parents pushing to teach creationism. Is he more likely to be either a teacher of biology or a teacher of biology and not vote for Trump? So which of these things is he likely to be? A teacher of biology or a teacher of biology who does not vote for Trump? down the answer. Five seconds left. Question two. If all A's are C's and all B's are C's, then are all A's also B's? seconds. Third question. Imagine your favorite actor endorsing toothbrush. Are you more or less likely to buy the toothbrush? seconds. You're offered one of two choices. Either get $50 right away or you a 50% chance of winning $110. So either $50 guaranteed or 50% chance of winning $110. It means 0%. That means you'll either win 0 or you'll win $110. Which do you choose? seconds. You are told that a coin is fair and observe a coin is being flipped 99 times and lands heads every time. What is your probability that it will land heads the hundredth time? Five seconds. All right. So let's get to some rationality basics now that you took the test. 
we are not cohesive. We think we are a cohesive brain and we are just, you know, the thoughts, the feelings that we think we have, we think we are the logical steps, we think we know ourselves. But recent research in cognitive neuroscience, behavioral economics, psychology shows us is that our minds are not cohesive. They're made up of many modules, they're made up of many complex components, and they act against each other. When we think we change our mind, when we think contradictory thoughts, it's okay, we actually are. It's okay to contradict ourselves. It's okay to be different. It's okay to not think the same things all the time. We are complex, and it's okay to understand that we are complex. What we are more like is this, an elephant and a rider. Now, who, can, who knows the analogy of the elephant and rider and can explain it to the rest of the group? Easily. Yes, what is your name? turning around? Hmm? Is it the turning around an elephant? Uh, that's not quite what I'm getting at. So somebody else who knows more about the elephant on the right, but I appreciate you giving the answer. Max. So uh, the elephant on the rider is a metaphor for how we are uh, mostly and most powerfully uh, an animal at heart. Um, uh, something that has an immediate sort of instinctual response. Uh, the elephant is not very wise. It has some ability to think, but mostly it just sort of powers along uh, in some way. And then there's a smaller bit of us that is more reflective and aware, the rider on top of the elephant, who is capable of guiding that Very animal, small. Uh, but who is not nearly as strong and has to uh, exert uh, a weaker form. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the rider is the more rational part of ourselves, and it's the more logical one. And the elephant is the more pretty, colorful, emotional one. And it has, as you can get, see from the picture, it has many, many different components and layers and drives and desires. And the rider is more cohesive, uniform, and logical. But the elephant is much bigger and more powerful. So it's much more of who we are. It's much more a part of who we are. And we don't recognize it. When we think of who we are, we only think of this part of us, the brain part, the gray part. So, the elephant is typically referred to as system one, <coughs> and it's an autopilot system. It's subconscious, it's automatic, it's habitual, it's what our habits are made of. It's very fast, it's very intuitive, it's very emotional. It takes sec milliseconds to turn on. Whereas the intentional part, the rider part, is conscious, mindful, it's attentive. It's slow, it's reasoning-oriented, it's logical-oriented. We need both parts. We, we can't survive without either part. And we are much more the elephant than we are the rider. So we have to remember that and keep that in mind, that we can't respect either system or orient toward just the rider part or just the elephant part. Both parts are really important to focus on. So both parts are really important for us to understand. So. As part of that, we have to think about cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are situations where typically the elephant and sometimes the rider goes wrong. So these are typical mistakes in our mind that comes from systematic errors with how our mind works, with how these system one and system two function. Our, the elephant part gets things right maybe about 80% of the time. So it's pretty good. It's pretty quick, reactive. That's good. But it, those 80% of the time, it makes systematic and predictable errors a number of times. So 20% of the errors, in many times, they're systematic and predictable. And they are called cognitive biases in the literature. There are some cognitive biases that have to do with the writer as well. But, so both of them make errors. So we can predict these errors. We can predict some of these problems. And this is some of the stuff that rationality focuses on. How do we predict the errors? And how do we change the elephant and the rider to win at light? How do we retrain the rider and the elephant to steer the elephant in the right direction for ourselves to make the best decisions, to avoid these cognitive biases, these landmines in the road that lead us in the wrong directions, that lead us to make irrational decisions? So. We direct the rider to motivate the elephant and shape the path to where we want to go. 
And this gets us back to the exam that we took just a little bit ago. Now you can cheat. You can talk to a partner for five minutes about the results, and then we'll discuss the actual answers. So take five minutes, talk to a partner, find a partner around you, and talk about the results. So Max was the president of a secular student uh, club in college. Uh, so I want hands uh, just for um, before we go to the answers. How many voted for be a teacher of biology? Raise your hand. How many voted for be a teacher of biology and not vote for Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If all A's are, how many said uh, all A's are also B's? And how many did not? Presumably. Are you more or less likely to buy the toothbrush? More likely to buy the toothbrush? Less likely? Equally? That was an option. Yes. Yeah. Uh, who would get fifty dollars? Who would get a uh, fifty percent chance of ten hundred? So, uh, the pro for the probability question, who said something like 50%? Who said something like about 50%? So, about 50%? About 50%. About 50%. Oh, about 50%. Oh, about yes. I know. Yes. <laughs> 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 All right. Now you can shoot. Answer one. So, good. Looking out for the conjunction fallacy. All possible maxes are teachers of biology. Only some maxes will not vote for Trump. Yes. Are all possible maxes teachers of biology? Yes. In the question. Uh, so the probability is 100%? The probability that max for answer to one is all maxes uh, are they teachers of biology or are they teachers of biology and not who don't who? But, but the probability of the first one is 100%. Yes. Oh, yes. All possible maxes are teachers of biology, and so only some will not vote for Trump. I think like all maxes under consideration. Yeah, all maxes under consideration. You have two options. Okay. Yeah. So that's the conjunction fallacy. Remember, the conjunction of two factors. You know, one that is this clear to everyone? Uh, the conjunction fallacy is the idea that one thing, a totality, is always going to be bigger than some chunk of it, some pieces of it. Because in all cases, all maxes are te teachers of biology, only some maxes will not vote for Trump. All right, so the answer to number two, you have to avoid the undistributed middle term error. Consider assigning the word human to letter A and ostriches to letter B. Letter C is two-legged. Now it reads, all humans are two-legged. All ostriches are two-legged. If all A's are B's, then all humans are ostriches. Oops, doesn't sound like all humans are ostriches. So that's an error in that sort of terminology. Let's go on to, them to C. Beware the halo effect. The halo effect causes us to perceive one positive ca characteristic of a person to judge the rest of the person's characteristics positively, regardless of the actual truth. So, if um, if we have an actor who endorses, your favorite actor, endorses a product, that doesn't mean the product is actually good. You know, for example, the actor might have been paid to endorse that product. Now, the evidence just indicates that the actor was paid to endorse the product. It doesn't mean that the product is good, and you should not convey your positive feelings for the actor to the product. Next, loss aversion. Loss aversion can cause us to do quite rational things. Imagine repeating the exercise a hundred times. If you choose $50 each time, you'd wind up $500 poorer on average. So, that means that it is rational for all of you in this room, who presumably don't really need $50 desperately, to choose the 50% of $110 for that choice. And finally, if you said 50% for the coin flip, you might be falling to, to conformity to a fallacy. 
if an authority figure tells you that the coin is not loaded, but then you observe it land heads 99 times, it's time to update your beliefs. Don't believe that the authority figure is telling you the truth. Now the next part is just for you to think and discuss. Think and write by yourself for 5 minutes about how these biases might be negatively impacting your life, then discuss this topic with other folks around you, and write down any additional ideas you get. Please go ahead. All right. So I thought you. I hope you had a good enough time, enough time to discuss these things. And this brings us to the end of the formal part. And I we will go to the question and answer part at this point, where we'll discuss these topics. And you're welcome to ask any questions. For a PowerPoint of this presentation, you can go to slideshare.net and intentional insights. You can check out the free version of my book, Find Your Purpose Using Science, there. You can get in touch with me, and you can visit Intentional Insights content. If you want more information about this sort of stuff, Agnes will distribute a sign-up sheet where you have an opportunity to sign up for Intentional Insights email and listserv, to volunteer, donate to support our work. We do this work to reach out to a broad audience to bring rationality concepts and effective giving concepts to them. There are a number of people here who are volunteers and donors to the organization. So if you want to support, donate, volunteer to the organization, you can sign up to on the same thing, listserv as well. And Agnes will also give out stickers if you want to show your rationality pride by having stickers <laughs> around the touch lens. So please go ahead, distribute those. And in the meantime, let's Share some thoughts and realizations that you have. Who would like to go first? Yes, uh, your name. We don't have name I'm Jason. Jason. Um, as far as what's the best way to get started for developing a rational mindset, uh, I'm thinking it's just doing it before anything, right? Well, oh, uh, so. Intentional Insights has a lot of content. This, the, what organizations specialize in is having content around this. So reading Intentional Insights content, and then there are a lot of specific questions and strategies there that uh, you can pass it on to Jason. So that uh, what you can actually find out, figure out, use to get into this stuff. And there's a lot of resources and links there to other ways of developing a rational mindset. Another way to do so is, of course, coming here to Columbus Rationality. That's a great resource. So we have presentations like this here. This is the basics of rationality. Next time I'll be presenting here on effective altruism, so how you think rationally about giving, for example. And a lot of similar topics are presented here. So coming here, doing these presentations is another good way of doing that. Sure. Is it okay if I supplement your comments on Please. we get started? One way that I found it pretty easy to, to start the habit of uh, when I came along to rationality was the basic, what's called probability thinking. Mm -hmm. So whenever I uh, notice myself forming an opinion, mm -hmm. I think of it as a percentage chance. Mm -hmm. So instead of just saying to myself, I think X is true, mm -hmm. I think to myself, how sure am I? Maybe I'm 95% that X is true. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm 60% that X is true. Simply developing that habit. Definitely. And Max has uh, several posts on intentional insights around developing probabilistic thinking. So that uh, will be definitely a good place to start. There are some posts on intentional insights around agency, so how to actually figure out whether your beliefs are true and how to make decisions and so on, and around elephant and rider stuff. So these are good starting posts to get into question. I, I thought the most interesting uh, part of the quiz was the bit about the toothbrush. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's uh, there's something in uh, rationality called a biased blind spot. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that I struggle with a lot. Uh, people, it, it's been demonstrated that um, you can actually do some harm by exposing people to uh, knowledge of 
cognitive biases and things mm -hmm. because you get uh, you hear about this sort of thing and you're like, oh, okay, now I will avoid it. Now, you know, if there's a halo effect or something like that, um, I'm going to just not react that way. And this works all well and good if you're the writer, if you're being deliberate, you know, you uh, if you know about the halo effect, then you might reason, okay, this is not good evidence to buy a toothbrush or something like that. But, uh, but still, the bias is in the elephant, right? The bias is in the emotional or immediate or intuitive automatic reaction to that endorsement mm -hmm. and to the attention that it brings. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a trap that we get into in rationality where we hear about uh, something like the halo effect and then we spend some time thinking about it and attending to it and suddenly we think we're <laughs> perfectly rational or uh, not prone to it. And um, I think that there's, there's something to be said about acknowledging our biases and steering away from them hurting us rather than pretending like we are above them or they have no impact on our lives. Do you have any thoughts on this? I don't know. I sure. Don't know I think uh, that's a really important point to remember that we're, regardless of knowing about bias, we're still going to be biased and we're still going to be emotionally pulled in this direction. There are a number of strategies to have been shown by research to work against biases. One is to notice when we're likely, notice situations when we're likely to be biased. So just bring them to our conscious attention. So when an actor we like endorses a toothbrush, notice that that's a situation that's likely to, you know, cause us to be more likely to get that. When we see an attractive guy standing by a car, notice that that's likely to make us more likely to buy that car, you know, in the commercial. So, or a girl for those who are guys. So, uh, <laughs> whichever, or whatever <laughs> sexual, wh whichever sexual preference you are likely to go for. Yes. So, uh, those are things that are likely to, so, uh, there's a matter of training oneself to bring these situations to one's attention. There are strategies called trigger action plans that one that one can use to train oneself. And there's some content about this on the Intentional Insights website. We talk about this in Columbus Rationality, where when you notice a situation that's you like that you acknowledge is going to bias you, then you bring that to your conscious attention through a trigger action plan, which I'm not going to talk about unless somebody wants me to go delve into it but then you have a strategy to counteract that. So uh, one strategy to bias oneself is called de-anchoring. So de-anchoring is a strategy where if you know you're biased, you push strongly against that bias. So if you know that you're going to be biased by a halo effect by an attractive guy standing next to a car, you're going to push strongly away from that and you're going to say, you're going to discount your liking for that car by saying, I'm more likely to like that car because there's an attractive guy standing next to it. So that's uh, an easy way to, just a quick way to deal with the halo effect. There are various other strategies for debiasing as well. There's also the other push, the other way where it's like, you're not going for something because someone's endorsing it, but you also fuck against it. Mm -hmm. Like there, uh, there's a lot of people that are, yeah. you know, against top 40. So they assume that all top 40 music is bad. Or, you know, or if a movie is, you know, high grossing, they assume, you know, mm -hmm. it's almost like a countercultural thing. You know? mm -hmm. I, I find myself having to be like, you know, try not to have that bias or the impulse to s just discount something that's popular. That's true. So, just because something is popular doesn't mean it's bad. Mm -hmm. You know, just and just because something is not popular doesn't mean it's good. So, it's an indication, just because something is popular just means it's popular. It means it's fitting into the population's taste. It means it's well marketed or something like that. So it doesn't mean anything so beyond that. Right. right. So it's important to look at the evidence and see what it's actually indicating. See what the evidence is actually indicating. For example, if you have a lot of people who believe in God, it is not necessarily evidence that there is a God that exists. It's evidence that there's a lot of people who believe in a certain idea and they were convinced by a certain idea. Now, that might be indication of a certain very powerful 
of you know religious propaganda machine that has convinced a lot of people into believing that.